scripture reading this morning is going to be from Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 6. So it reads, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, yet, sorry, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Bible to Isaiah chapter 42, is where we're going to begin in just a minute. I appreciate Brother Manuel reading the Isaiah 53. When we talk about the suffering servant, that's the verses we normally will go to, and deservedly so. But the interesting thing about the, God, or the uh, book of, uh, of Isaiah, there's a part of this that they will actually call the gospel of Isaiah, and it's about these songs or these poems that are written about this servant. And Isaiah 53 is the most popular one. And we'll get to that as the weeks go by, Lord willing. But it starts back in Isaiah 42. This messianic prophecy of this one that is to come. We talk about the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is coming from David's lineage he is going to sit on that throne. All the things that the Israelites or Israel would have thought of at the time. And somehow, these amazing words that are written in Isaiah were forgotten. Because they talk about this one who is going to come and he was going to be a servant. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of these that are, that are written here in the book of Isaiah. I was going to do them all in one sermon, and then I realized you can't. So we're splitting them up, and you're welcome. But Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, is the first one that I would like to look at. And we'll go ahead and read those. He says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will, will wait expectantly for his law. It goes on and actually we'll talk about God uh, and what he's going to do in this new song that will be sung. We're not going to get into that this morning. But it's interesting, these verses that are talking about this servant. Because when we get to Isaiah 53, we obviously know who that's talking about. We certainly see that with the Ethiopian eunuch when he is reading Isaiah 53. And Philip is able to help him or teach him Jesus by using those verses. The other reason we know that this is Jesus is because it's fulfilled when he's here. These verses are going to be used. And so we're introduced to this servant here in Isaiah 42. And the first thing I want you to notice in verse 1 is the word my. So this is the New American Standard. This word is going to be used to describe God. And he says, it's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. 
This is going to be quoted in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 17 through 21, just so you're aware if you're taking notes. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Interesting thing about verse 1 to me is what you also see in chapter 53. The use of God and his my, and then the use of our sins in Isaiah 53. That this was about God sending his son. This was the plan. Verse 1 has all three of them, my spirit as well. There, this All three, the plan that was established, that Jesus Christ was going to come. He was going to be the servant, the one that was willing to do what the Father wanted him to do in this plan. And he was going to die for you and for me. He was a servant. We've talked about that a lot in class, for sure. You keep your finger here in Isaiah 42. But there are other verses that talk about this. John 3.16 certainly discusses this. And one of the things that happens with John 3.16, I'm afraid, is that it becomes one of those verses that we can quote, and we almost forget the meaning behind the words of what it's saying. Isaiah 42, verse 1, says a very similar thing. It's my chosen one. I'm going to send him. uh, John, the third chapter, in verse 16, beginning, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. People memorize verse 16, and deservedly so. I encourage you to memorize verse 17 as well. He loved this world so much. He loved you so much that he sent the chosen one, as Isaiah 42 says. My chosen, the only begotten son, that we can be saved. To save the world, it says. God wants a relationship with every single soul. We all have the choice to make of whether or not that's going to happen. But what I want you to notice and at least appreciate is the love that our God has for you. He was willing to send his son to die for you just simply to give you the opportunity to have a relationship with him. Romans, the fifth chapter, will say the same. But this time, you get a little bit more of understanding our side of things. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, he says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. One of the things that took me a long time to really appreciate is what God is willing to do for me. You can quote the verses. You can see them. You might see them a big sign tonight that says John 3.16 at the Super Bowl. But to truly understand what those words mean, Romans, the fifth chapter, says you were his enemy. You were an enemy of God, whether you knew it or not, or thought it or not. You were an enemy of God. And to save you from his wrath, which you don't have to read a lot of the Bible to understand that wrath and the power that he has. To save you from that, he sent his son to die for you. That he can save you by his life, as verse 10 says here. While you're his enemy, while you are helpless, he sent his son to die for you, to save you from his wrath. Our God is an awesome God. It is amazing to me what our God has done for us. And it is also just as amazing to me when we read the Old Testament, that the Old Testament folks took God for granted, just like people in 2024 do. That we forget what he did for us. 
how much he loves you. Not loved. He did love you. He loves you. Today. That he sent his son to die for you. Going back to Isaiah 42. I hope and pray that you understand where this servant came from. Who he is. What he does. And the fact that he could have come as any king. And he would have deserved all the praise, all the glory, all the servitude of all mankind while he was here. But he came as a humble servant. Isaiah 42 and verse 2. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. What an amazing verse that is of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He had every right to do that. And yet that's not the way that our Savior came. We certainly can talk about, as Isaiah 53 will say, that he did not open his mouth when he was suffering. But our Savior came as humble as you possibly could as the King of Kings. There are various verses that you can look at Philippians the second chapter verses 5 through 8 Where it talks about him coming as a Bond servant Maybe we don't understand fully what that is When Jesus washed the feet in John 13 Of his disciples he took on The lowest of the low Servant in a house By washing their feet Jesus Christ Our savior The glorified one the king of kings left heaven to come here to take on a form of us and not even the in essence the best of us from our perspective or man's perspective he did not come with this huge crown and this amazing army that people could see and took over rome as many of them thought he was going to he was a lowly servant one who had no place to lay his head he will say One in second that says, though he was rich, he became poor for your sake, so that you can become rich. The great servant, our humble Savior, Jesus Christ. Over in Matthew, the 26th chapter, I want you to notice, and, and this is nothing that's going to be new talked about here but I want you to notice our Savior Jesus Christ was involved with the creation of all things think about that he was involved with the creation of all things and in Matthew 26 these verses that we're going to look at I want you to notice what he was willing to go through and at any time could have stopped at any time, we're told. Could have stopped. And yet was willing to go through all of these things. And we're not even going to get to the crucifixion. Judas, one of his apostles in verse 49, comes up and kisses him. We talked about that on Wednesday night in class. And Jesus says in verse 50, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on him and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. We know that's Malchus, and we know that Jesus puts it back on. Amazing. Verse 51, behold, or excuse me, verse 52. And then Jesus said, put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 10,000 angels sounds better in a song than 12 legions, but 12 legions is a lot more than 10,000. And if you've ever seen what one angel can do or read what one angel can do, that is an amazing verse. That at any time he says, don't you think I could call on my father? You think about that power. 
what would you have done? I know what I would have done. We would be reading a whole lot different verse here. It is amazing to think about him. Who he was, the power that he had, and yet he was willing to go through all of this for you and for me. He goes on here and talks about how in verse 56 this was done. Well, let's, start, let's pick up in verse 54. This was done for the scriptures to be fulfilled. Verse uh, 55. Jesus says to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this was taking place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those that were closest to him, leave him and flee. Can you imagine their perspective of seeing what's happening to Jesus as the Messiah and knowing that it was Judas that did this? They all leave him. Jesus, in verse 57, is brought before Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. Peter was at a distance as far as the, the courtyard and the high priest and entered in and sat out with the officers the outcome and then all of a sudden you have this false testimony that is occurring here and they begin to hit Jesus and they spit on him and they say who hit you in verse 68 prophesy you Christ who hit you and you know what the amazing thing about that verse is Jesus could have told them he could have told them who hit him and yet he did not open his mouth why? So Scott Taylor can choose whether or not he's going to follow God today. Or you can choose whether or not you're going to follow him. A humble servant. Not only was he a humble servant, he is a compassionate servant. If you go back to verse 3. Of Isaiah 42, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He is faithfully bring forth, he will faithfully bring forth justice. You talk about gentleness, you talk about love of our Savior. He is the one in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in verse 15, that absolutely can understand or sympathize, it says there, what we go through. The amazing thing of the scriptures is a passage like Matthew 14. In verse 14, and again, I just want you to notice this is understating what, what is being said here. Jesus, it says, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Just that verse is amazing. Let alone every other time you see his compassion. Let alone now that I think of, of 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, where he's the God of all comfort. He knows what you're going through. He knows those of us that are suffering every single day. He knows. He has compassion. In Matthew the 11, chapter 28 through 30, verses certainly we talk about often his great invitation is full of this compassion. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I know there are people that are weary. I know there are people that are carrying these burdens. He says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Have you ever heard of a king saying, I am gentle. I am humble in spirit. You give me your yoke. Or you give me your burden. Does that sound like a king? Samuel, when he's warning the people, actually says the king's going to give you more burden. This is our God. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
our humble, compassionate servant. Our humble and compassionate God. The last verse that I would like to look at this morning is verse 4. One of the most amazing things about Jesus is that not only was he humble, not only was he compassionate, but he was joyful. We talk about choosing joy, and we'll talk about that again in just a minute. Can you imagine being the Son of God, there for creation, there to watch all that mankind has done, and choose joy while you're here on earth, knowing full well what you're about to face. For the joy that is set before him, he endured the cross. Our Savior chose something knowing full well what the consequences were, what the struggles were, and we struggle choosing joy when we are so blessed, not only by the physical blessings that we have in this country, but the spiritual blessings we have because of Jesus Christ. If you go back to Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, in verse 4, he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Now, we've talked about these coastlands a couple of times, or these nations. Thanks be to God for this, because what this is is the prophecy for the Gentiles to come. That God's people would include Gentiles. And if you don't know, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So that's us. Most of us, anyway. So we understand that God has chosen to give us the opportunity for salvation through Jesus Christ. And though Jesus was going to go through some horrible things, when he was down, when he was tempted, when he was struggling, he always turned to the Father. The same exact thing that you and I can do. I do want to look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter, as we bring the lesson to a close. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about these, this, the faith that all these men and women had, some of them by name, others that are just said they were willing to go through such horrible things. But in chapter 12, because of those cloud of witnesses, as it calls them in verse 1. He says, Therefore we have such a so great a cloud of witness surrounding us. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When you are struggling with the things that you go through in life, look at Jesus Christ. When you are going through good days and having great times, look to Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. In all that we go through, fix your eyes on our Savior. He was willing to choose joy. But not only did he choose joy, he chose you. He chose you. One of the things I strongly suggest all of us to do is certainly understand from the greater good, God was willing to send his son to die for all. You have got to make this personal. He died for you. For the sins you have committed. He chose you. In John 17, he prays for you and for me. The question simply is, what do we choose? That is an amazing question. That when you look up there and you see that, Jesus chose me, but I get a choice to choose whether or not I'm going to follow him. What's my choice? And yet people choose all the time not to have a relationship with him. What do you choose? 
appreciate Patrick leading the songs that he led. One of them, whether you can read that or not, it's up to you. But it's Make Me a Servant. It's one of my favorite songs in the, in the book that we sing because of the words that they say. It's not about how I am going to be like or compared to other people. This is about me becoming like Jesus Christ. Living my life in service to him. Because he is the servant. He is the example of what it looks like to serve. Make me like you. I hope and pray that first of all you understand what he was willing to go through for you. Hopefully you've noticed up there the crown of thorns with the little drop of blood that's on there. You just think about just that. How horrible that is. Let alone everything we talked about and the things he went through that we didn't talk about. For you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Knowing full well, by the way, all that we have done. All that you have done in your life. There are things that you've done in your life that you probably hope nobody ever fig figures out here. Or you don't go around publicizing it to everybody. God knows. And sent his son to die for you. I pray that humbles you. I pray that that helps us understand that we need to choose to be his child. If you have not obeyed the gospel, now's the time. Because of his long suffering and his patience, he is waiting and pleading and has given you and given me another opportunity to get our lives right with him. I beg you to take advantage of that. I know well aware as a, as a preacher that you come to the end and one day a preacher is going to say, this may be the last time you have the opportunity to make sure you're right with him. And they're going to be right. He is long suffering. But he will return. And we need to make sure that we are right with him. If you need to obey the gospel, do not wait. If you have questions, ask them. As always, make sure you're praying for one another. If there's anything that we can do for you right now,